What drives the price of oil is what a bunch of contract traders think is going to happen with supply and demand 12 months from now. That has always stuck in my head because when my career continued to unfold, I spent several years with other op in operations, then actually started my own engineering firm, you become aware very clearly of how margins throughout industry, from production to refining, transportation, export, import, are all driven by what people think the market is going to do. You know, most people, when I'm giving a speech to non oil and gas folks and they ask about markets, I have heard people ask about a movie. <laughs> 35 years ago, 1983, the movie Trading Places came out with Dan Aykroyd and uh, Eddie Murphy, in which there are two big financial tycoons, uh, Randolph and Mortimer Duke, and they place a $1 bet to see if they can switch places between Eddie Murphy, who at the time was a homeless person, and Dan Aykroyd, a young stock trader, if they can, they can actually get them to switch places and one become a criminal and the other one become successful. When Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy got wind of the Duke plot to screw with their lives, they decided that they would screw back. And the, more, the, more, the Duke brothers had decided that they were going to try to corner the frozen orange juice concentrate market. And the way they were going to do this is they got a hold of a market report a few days before stock trading opened. Now they did not know that Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd had replaced their market report with a false one. So they sent their guy into the trading floor in 1983, this is a, a wild scene in the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, and told their guy, the Duke brothers did, to buy every contract, every futures contract they could of frozen orange juice. Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy, having the real report, knowing what the real situation was, decided to sell on a short sale at a high price all of the futures that they could sell. At the end of the movie, Randolph and Mortimer Duke had gone broke, and Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd had gotten rich. And the scene that is pertinent to today is when the entire world found out what the real market report was. If you remember the movie, there's a really boring voice comes on television. It says, well, ladies and gentlemen, the US Secretary of Agriculture. And this really dorky looking guy with glasses comes up and a nasally voice says, the outlook for orange juice production was unaffected by the recent freeze therefore markets will remain stable and the floor goes crazy as everyone finds out what the real market outlook is going to be so we are in a similar situation here except that I am not the Secretary of Agriculture and none of you care about orange juice but we will talk about oil markets we'll talk about oil markets in three ways we're going to talk very quickly about pricing what we think prices are going to do this year we're going to talk about supply and we're going to talk about demand before I do, I want to get everybody here who's thinking about oil to think about two things that often in oil markets we forget. The first one is oil is only one form of energy and to understand when we look out beyond just this year, you have to understand what the global demand for overall energy is going to do. The second one is when we talk about demand for oil, you have to remember that demand for oil is not necessarily in the same place that consumption of oil products is located. Demand for oil is centered around refineries. So we have to consider those two things, which we will when we talk about the market. To start off with, where is the global demand for energy going? Interestingly enough, over the last five to 10 years, the growth in global demand for energy has remained relatively stable. It goes up by about 1.5% every year, fairly religiously. To give you some numbers, if you wanted to put it into total amounts of BTUs, I'm talking from coal to natural gas, solar power, any, how, any way the human race uses energy. We use, we are getting close to 600 quadrillion BTUs of energy that's consumed around the world every year. About 584 is forecasted for 2018. How much is a quadrillion? I think out of this because the engineer in me loves to do this. If a thousand dollar bill, and I added a thousand of his friends to make a million dollars. That thousand dollar bills is 4.3 inches tall. Now, if you said, well, how much to get to a quadrillion? If you turn that stack on its side and you kept adding thousand dollar bills, you would get to a quadrillion when you had gone around the earth two and a half times. A million dollars, 4.3 inches, a quadrillion is around the world two and a half times. The world uses today close to 600 quadrillion BTUs of energy. The largest piece of that, in fact, the two largest pieces are still oil and natural gas by a healthy margin. Of all of the places that we get energy from on, a, on the planet, the one that's growing the fastest is natural gas. 
However, when we talk about oil in a minute, we'll understand that oil is still a growing component of that market, which a lot of people are confused about. People think that hydrocarbons, oil, and natural gas are dwindling in their usage. Actually, the opposite is true. Now, let's talk about pricing. We think in all the market research that we've done that the market is a relatively stable one today, especially compared to the last few years. When you look at where supply is, where demand is, what the forecasts are for the year, we expect it to stay relatively consistent. So I expect us to see prices range between $58 and $66 a barrel for the biggest chunk of the year. Now does that mean, for example, today I think we just dropped below $60 a barrel today because U.S. inventory climbed over the last few days as we're entering the slow refining season. Yes, we may get outside of that, but I don't expect any substantial trends up or down outside of that pricing. If you asked me, by the way, a year and a half ago, in the middle of 2016, Ryan, what do you expect oil prices to do? I expected oil prices to get to $60 a barrel. If you want to test me on that, you can go back and look at speeches that I gave back when oil was even in the 20s and 30s, saying we expected it to get to $60 a barrel. How do we know that? When you look around the world at what it takes to produce the incremental barrel of oil at 95, 97, 99 million, at 99 millionth barrel a day of oil, you can't do that for $40 a barrel. You can't even do it for 50. You can't even do it for 60 or 70. If it wasn't for government subsidized programs, we couldn't produce enough oil to supply the world. As we look today, I'm forecasting that we'll hang, we'll hang a relatively tight, relatively stable environment through the year, 58 to 66 dollars a barrel. Now let's talk about why that is. On the demand side, over the last couple of years, demand for oil around the world has grown roughly 1.7, 1.8 million barrels per day per year, and that's been a relatively consistent pace. We'll see in some years that, oh, it was 1.8 this year, the next year 1.6, but the average, the trend line stays the same. The one thing we look at a lot when we try to understand demand is, is that demand really for oil or is it for refined products? So we have to look at in the back end of the refineries, what have refining inventories done? Over the last year, refi uh, crude oil stockpiles, international crude oil stocks, dropped at a rate of around 400,000 barrels uh, per day. The, the market was undersupplied by 400,000 barrels a day over the course of 2017. However, if refining inventories had increased during that time, it would have meant that demand on the back end was not climbing with production. But that didn't happen. Refining inventories around the world stayed relatively consistent. So in this case, the, the drop or the increased demand for oil was, was matched by the increased consumption for oil products. Going into this year, the International Energy Administration, the IEA, has forecasted a 1.3 million barrel a day increase over the course of 2018. The EIA, Energy Information Agency, here in the United States, forecasted 1.7 million barrels a day. We actually believe it's going to be much closer to the U.S., the EIA forecast, and even higher. We think that trends for demand for oil is going to go above what both of those agencies predicted. On the one hand, people are thinking, well, but the price of oil is higher. The price for refined products is higher, and yes, traditionally, higher energy prices does mean a curb in demand. However, the IMF has forecasted this year a 3.6% global economic growth. That is the highest. Nothing drives energy consumption like economic growth. So while, yes, energy prices are higher, we think that consumption is actually going to trump that no pun intended, and we think that energy consumption, oil in particular, will go by 1.7, 1.8, maybe as much as 1.9 million barrels a day. We'll come back to demand in a minute. Let's go on to supply. And by the way, I'm only going to talk for about another five or ten minutes. I want to open it up for questions and whatever you want to ask me about. We'll answer whatever market questions that you have. Let's talk about the supply side. At the end of 2017, the world was consuming around 99 million barrels. The demand was 99 million barrels a day, approximately. That was the trend. The world was producing around 98.6 million barrels a day. So as I said, the world was undersupplied, about 400,000 barrels a day. Coming into this year, we think that the demand, as I said, is going to grow close to 2 million barrels over the course of the year. We think that supply will grow a relatively similar amount. The lion's share of production still coming from OPEC at 32.5 million barrels. We think OPEC will hold that through the middle of the year and will hold that through the end of the year if it takes that to balance the market. We know that the United States is going to produce more oil, put more oil in the market. We think the United States is going to produce just shy of a million barrels a day more. 
We think the lion's share of that's going to come out of the Permian Basin, probably seven to 800,000 barrels a day will come just out of the Permian Basin. The rest of the United States is going to produce an incremental two or 300,000 barrels a day more. You're talking Bakken, Scoop and Stack, all the other plays around the United States. The other increase in oil production is going to come from Canada and Brazil. Those will be the two largest energy growth uh, nations. The two of them together will produce an extra 800 to 900,000 barrels a day based on projects that we actually have relatively good visibility to. The projects in those nations are not quick turnaround projects. Uh, you can talk about the big Suncor expansion up in Canada that's going to put another 200,000 barrels close to it per day on the market. We've seen that project coming for a long time. These are multi-year projects that are coming online. Between the United States, Canada, and Brazil, that will fill the largest chunk of the increase in demand. If there's any other additional increases, there may be slight increases in places like Libya and Nigeria. We don't expect, though, that those countries will put much additional oil on the market. Even Iran, who has said they want to get from 3.8 to 4.1 million barrels a day, we don't think we'll see a lot of that this year. Hence, with demand, with the world being undersupplied today, and new oil coming on the market, mostly in the United States, in fact, frankly, mostly in the Permian Basin, we think that the we world will spend most of its time in a slightly undersupplied scenario, which is what's going to keep oil prices relatively stable in that $58 to $66 a barrel range. What things could disrupt that? Well, on the demand side, if the world decided today it didn't need a whole lot more energy for some reason, just on a global scale, not just in oil, but overall energy, which would require a pretty substantial economic downturn, then that could disrupt our forecast in terms of demand. All of the indicators that we look at say that that's, not, that's extremely unlikely. On the, on the demand side, is there a chance that there could be a big spike in energy consumption, potentially? But once again, when we look at graphs of demand for energy based on everything from economic growth to energy costs, even construction projects, regional expansion, all of those things seem to indicate that that's not very likely. If anything, if, if either of the two scenarios was going to happen, it would more likely be an unforecasted growth. In other words, the world demanding more oil, not less. And we'll talk about what the market might do to respond to that. On the supply side, is there a chance that the world could overproduce? The only real big producers that could put a lot more oil on the market than the incremental growth that I talked about from places like Libya and Nigeria are Russia and Saudi Arabia. Both of those could easily put an additional half a million or million barrels a day on the market. However, they are heavily incentivized right now not to do that. Everyone knows how difficult it was to get that deal done, how long OPEC and the non-OPEC members worked to get that deal done. We believe they'll hold in their production at least until the middle of the year OPEC meeting. On the undersupply side, is there a chance that the world could see a drop-off? Yes, there is. You hear reports today that Venezuela is really struggling to put additional barrels on the market. and In fact, in fact it's struggling to put its current barrels on the market. Saw a report, I think just this last week, somebody forecasting they may lose 800,000 barrels a day of production by the end of this year. I don't think Venezuela is going to feel quite that much pain, but I do think that they're going to drop. Mexican oil production continues to drop. And there are a few other pockets around the world where production is going to drop. However, we think that the makeup from places like the United States, Canada, um, Brazil, will cover those shortfalls and still maintain a stable market environment. And if by some chance there is a really large drop in production from somewhere like Venezuela, what I expect we'll see is OPEC leaders, specifically Saudi Arabia, begin talking about expansion. I believe they want to hold a stable market environment and they will send market indicators even before their meeting that they anticipate that markets will open up in order to keep a stable market environment. If you ask the folks, the leaders from OPEC, the Saudi oil minister, I haven't asked him this person, although I will say he is also a graduate from the finest academic institution on the planet, mechanical engineering grad. Uh, I haven't asked him this personally, but I do believe that they would tell you they want to keep a nice stable price environment, 60s, maybe low 70s. When they get into the 80s, they don't believe that's good for the market, good for their influence on the market. So if the market begins to see some drops and some increase in uh, demand, and therefore, hey, prices are starting to go up, we think they'll send signals to try to bring some stability. All in all, what this means is that we're in a stable market environment. Go back to my original prediction. We think we're going to hold fairly close where we are for the course of 2018. Let's talk about what this means to 
people here at this conference and deals that are getting done today. What's important for the North American and specifically the Texas producer folks in the Permian Basin in Eagle Fork is access to markets. What you want is how do I get my product to the closest refinery or to the international market that wants to consume my product? What we need here is as much transportation capability as we can get, and we need as much refining capacity as we can get. We look around the world and I talk about where the demand for the increased demand for energy for oil is going to come. The lion's share of it is still coming from China and India, and in China specifically, they're investing billions in refinery expansion. India is also trying to increase their refinery numbers. You look outside of China and India. They make up about half of the increase in demand I talked about. The other half of that demand increase comes from undeveloped countries, the non-OECD countries that we talk about. Those countries have very little refining capacity and they're going to look for places like the United States oil, but to send them refined products. So the more expansion in refining we see in the United States, the ability to export those products to market will mean absolutely higher oil prices right here in Texas and across the United States. The last thing in terms of what we need to see, what we want to see as this market grows, is we do want to continue to see stable production. We want to see, you know, from a regulatory perspective, we want to see good market performance. At the end of the day, the average Texan doesn't really know much about what we do in this room and then they don't they don't really care what they know is that when the energy business is doing well that the average Texan is doing well it funds schools it funds roads it funds all sorts of government systems government programs that are driven out of Austin and even Washington DC but they do want to know that it's safe regulatory perspective is pipelines are put through neighborhoods like I live right here in Friendswood Texas right here through the middle of Friendswood Texas they want to know that that stuff is being done safely as the market is growing a lot, we see more and more new oil wells, new projects, new capital expansions. It's our job to make sure that the people of the state are confident in that. So you'll see us doing more and more to inform the public, to get more information out to the public. And for your part, as you guys, as industry trade shows go on, everybody from Texoga to the API to North American Prospect Expo, letting people know about what's happening is a good thing. The more people feel comfortable with what we're doing, the better it is for industry. So as you see good information out there, a general good public sentiment around what the industry is doing, coupled with additional expansion in pipelines and refining infrastructure, and this continued growth for demand around the world, those are all good for energy prices. Now let me get out of 2018 for a second with a long-term forecast. What happens in 2020, 2021, three, four years down the there's an argument in the market, in the world today about whether or not the world is going to in general be oversupplied or whether the market's going to be over demand or undersupplied. I'm in the second camp. I think that as you look around the world and we, every year we add a million, to two million barrels a day of crude oil. When you look out six years and we've added four and a half to six million barrels a day of consumption or demand, the world is going to struggle to fill that demand. I don't think the world can do it at the current price even at $60, $65 a barrel. I think when you look out three years that the market's going to have to put more dollars in to open up expansion today into places that isn't quite economical to fill that new demand. So let me come back to where I started, which is in this global demand for energy. I told you that the world every year adds about 1.5% to its total energy consumption every year. And you'll hear people that say, oh, you know, hydrocarbons, that's not sexy. No one wants oil and natural gas anymore. It's all wind and solar. Well, those people are full of crap. You heard me say that the world demand for oil this year is going to grow somewhere between 1.7 and 2 million barrels a day. In oil, in oil alone, that's a 1.7 to 2 percent growth in energy. If the world's energy demand is growing 1.5 percent and oil is growing by 2 percent, oil consumption is growing faster than the average energy consumption. And oil is not growing as fast as natural gas, which we didn't have time to talk about today. As the world looks for new energy sources, not so much in the developed nations, but in the non-OECD, undeveloped nations, they're looking at the easiest energy to harness, and that is still the hydrocarbon atom. So the oil business, the energy business, is going to be a business for a long time. And the United States, over the last decade, has positioned itself as a global energy supplier. Let's face it, we do it more efficiently and cleaner than everybody else in the world. So it makes sense that people want to buy our energy rather than try to do it themselves. Well, I said that you look at where the demand and energy is coming from. The lion's share of almost all of it is coming from Asia and non-economically developed countries. To run a refinery takes a very sophisticated staff, 
literally billions of dollars in infrastructure. The average non-economically developed country does not have the wherewithal to make those investments. Why not just buy gasoline, diesel, kerosene, jet fuel, all those products from U.S. refiners? So we believe, looking down the road, that the, the market is going to demand our energy. And it's going to demand it at a higher pace than it's actually demanding other sources of energy for the foreseeable future. So long way of saying that I think the energy market today is very good. That once again, we'll see a stable market environment through 2018 and through much of 2019. After that, we'll start to see markets get tightened up as supplies are shortened and prices begin to increase to open up new developments, especially in places like, um, especially places like the United States where we know the oil is there. It simply takes an extra dollar to get it. One last disclaimer on everything I've said. None of this trumps big geopolitical moves, a war, a, some sort of uh, Arab Spring, things that have happened in the past that disrupt the markets. You know, all those things and all the best economic predictions and uh, numbers and statistics we can look up don't supplant those things. So be aware that if, you're, if those sort of instabil instabilities, you hear about those things, all of those can throw market predictions out the window. Once again, looking at everything we see coming up this year, we don't see big risks of those, but they're always out there. There was a lot of stuff I threw at you. Um, one last thing I forgot to say, I do want to say, one forecast number that we have access to at the Railroad Commission, because every permit for an oil or gas well in the state of Texas comes to the Railroad Commission, which I run. If you look at the numbers of permits that are coming in in Eagleford and Permian Basin, talk about what's happening in those basins. In the Permian Basin in January alone, January was over 10% higher in terms of number of permits than the average in 2017. In Eagleford, it was 20% higher than the average of 2017. So we're seeing permit numbers today higher at the Railroad Commission for the predominant Texas developments higher than we saw in 2017, which is telling us we think those, the production numbers are absolutely going to increase at a pretty, pretty substantial pace and on par with the numbers that I forecasted in terms of future production for this year. Thanks for letting me dump a bunch of geeky numbers on you. What questions do you have for me? Please raise your hands and we'll have the mic yes, to sir. you. The question was, do I think that we've reached peak production? And if not, where do I think peak production will be? Globally as well as domestically. Uh, no, I don't think we've reached peak production. And there's a lot of simplistic uh, headlines out there about peak oil, peak demand, peak production. At the end of the day, the world has a lot of oil. The question is simply how much dollars does it take to produce it? And if you look at the pace of where the, oil, where the world is going today, and I'll use a, a, a geeky example. The engineer in me loves to talk about how you store energy, right? The world has yet to come up with a more efficient way of storing energy than a hydrocarbon molecule. And if you're in a non-developed country and you don't have sophisticated electrical grids, it's really easy to store a gallon of gasoline or even a compressed natural gas facility relative to complex electricity facilities and, once again, fancy electronic, electrical grids. So I think the world is going to continue to demand oil. And I, I absolutely think that we will see over the next 20 years you know, 110, 115 million barrels a day. The problem is to produce that oil will cost more dollars than what we currently produce 100 million barrels a day at. So, uh, no, I don't think we've reached peak production or peak demand here in the States or internationally. I will say that when you look at places like the Eagle Fruit, you are going to have to get into what you know, the, the tier two drilling areas, and that's going to require an extra dollar or two per barrel. But I think we'll see those dollars. There's still a lot of oil out of places like the Eagle Fruit. Even though the Permian Basin, there's a lot of oil even at current, current dollars to produce. You're welcome.